In Acts chapter 15, verse 14, God's new covenant people are referred to as a people for his name. If that be true, then we need to understand the progressive revelation of the name of God. In fact, one major issue is this, that in the Old Testament, you find the personal name of God, Yahweh, Y-H-W-H, almost 7,000 times, but it's translated Lord in the English Bibles. Why is this the case? Find out on this episode of Discover Your Spiritual Identity. This is the third episode in a series of three on our calling to be a people for his name. That title rests upon the people of God in the New Testament. Primarily, that's when it was given to them in the first apostolic council. James stood up and he was recounting how Peter had gone to Cornelius' household and what a move of God took place there. And James said, Simon has declared how God at the first visited the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. One of the first titles attributed to the people of God in this new covenant era. Well, what does that mean? Why are we a people for his name? I give five reasons. Number one, we exist for the glory of his name. Number two, we exist for the revelation of his name. We're in a world filled with many deities that are false gods and false goddesses, and we exist for the revelation of his name, the true God. Number three, we exist for the impartation of his name, the power that is in his name. Number four, we exist for the vindication of his name in a world that often blasphemes his name. And number five, we exist for the proclamation of his name. So, if we are a people for his name, we have a task at hand, a five-fold task that has been given to us. I'm very excited about the information we're going to cover in this episode because we're going into the mystery of the Tetragrammaton. That's a word for the name, the personal name, the primary personal name of God revealed in the Old Testament. It's only four letters long in the Hebrew. However, over 2,000 times that personal name for God is just translated into the word Lord, which means master. It's a title, not a personal name. Why? Why did that happen? Why wasn't the personal name of God given as it is found originally in our scripture? Why is it hidden behind this title, Lord? We're going to find out a little bit more about that, a great deal more about that as we proceed. First, let's go to Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Well, there's a mystery hidden there because the Hebrew word that is translated God is Elohim, which is the plural of the Hebrew word El. El is singular for God. Elohim is is plural. In fact, Elohim is translated over 200 times into the word gods, small letter G, but over 2,000 times is translated into the word God. Isn't that strange? No, not really, because it's a mystery unveiled. God is revealing from the fourth word in the English Bible that there's a plurality in his nature. A plural word translated singular indicates to me that there's a plurality in the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and yet these three are one God. There is only one God. What a mystery. And God continues the unveiling of that revelation all through the Bible. No wonder in Deuteronomy 32, verse 3, Moses said, I will proclaim the name of the Lord and ascribe greatness to our God. When we learn his name, when we understand the mystery of his name, then we can proclaim his name. And in doing so, we reveal the greatness of our God. That's part of our calling to be a people for his name. 
we draw attention to that name. I love the fact in Exodus chapter 3, listen to this, that Moses said to God, now this is a conversation Moses is having with God, and he says, indeed, when I come to the children of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they say, what is his name? Then what shall I say to them? Moses is pleading with God to tell him exactly how to describe God, what name to attribute to him. And God said to Moses, I am who I am. The King James Version says, I am that I am. He said, thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent you, has sent me to you. Why would God term himself that way? Because I believe fundamentally, it was his way of saying, I'm not a has-been God. I'm not just a God that appeared to Abraham 400 years ago, and now I've disappeared from the stage. It was his way of saying, I'm the same. I am, not I was, but I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It also denotes eternal existence, that God has no beginning and God has no ending, and he is dependent on nothing for his existence. So he is the self-existent one. That's basically what that means. I am who I am. Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. I think it's a strange thing and yet understandable why many New Agers like to attribute this name to themselves. And you find in many New Age books on proclamations to even dare to say, I am that I am, or, or to attribute to yourself eternal existence that way. But that is a name that is reserved for God alone. All right, let's go to Exodus chapter 6, verses 2 and 3. And God spoke to Moses and said, I am the Lord. I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty. In the Hebrew, that's El Shaddai. I appeared to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as God Almighty, but by my name, Lord, was I not known to them. But wait just a minute. Two times there in the English Bible, we have the word Lord, which simply means master or one who is in authority or dominion. And yet in the Hebrew, it's the tetragrammaton. It's Y-H-W-H in the English alphabet. In the Hebrew alphabet, it's yud Hey vav Hey. That's yud H E Y yud Hey vav V-A-V, and then H-E-Y, yud Hey vav Hey, And that's, I believe, correctly translated or rendered Yahweh. Unfortunately, in the original Hebrew, there were no vowels. And so all you have are consonants. And the vowels were, I suppose, uh, inserted by those who spoke the language. As they read it, they would interpret what the words meant. You can remove vowels from most English words and easily figure out what the words are. And that was the way their language functioned at that time. And so because of that, or at least part of the reason, the correct pronunciation of yad Hey vav Hey has been lost. And I asked a Jewish man one time, I said, which is right? I said, the traditional way of saying it is Jehovah, but that couldn't be the case because there's no J in Hebrew. And many people say it should be Yahovah or Yahweh. I said, which is the correct name? And this is a, a Hebrew man. He's not a Messianic Jew. And his eyes lit up with joy. And he said, that is a problem the Messiah will solve when he arrives. And I thought, oh, yes, he will solve that problem because his name shall be one. And there shall be one Lord and his name shall be one. And and he shall reign over all the earth, and we'll know him by name. But anyway, God spoke to Moses and said, I am YHWH, I am Yahweh. I appeared to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as El Shaddai, but by my name Yahweh, I was not known to them. So 
how did the pronunciation get lost? And how do Jewish people deal with this? Well, when they read through the Hebrew Bible and they come to the ineffable name of God, that's what they call it. And ineffable means indescribably wondrous. And when they come to the ineffable name of God, instead of trying to pronounce it, instead of trying to say it, they will insert the word Adonai, which also means Lord or Master, because they want to reverence the name of God to the highest degree. In fact, that's part of the way the correct pronunciation was lost, because tradition evolved in Israel where the Jewish people were so sensitive to keeping the third commandment, to keep the name of God holy and, and to not take the name of the Lord in vain, that they would not speak the name of God except on one day, one day of the year on Yom Kippur, the 10th day of the seventh month, when the blood of a goat was offered up and sprinkled on the mercy seat in the Holy of Holies, it was the holiest day of the year, Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, in the holiest place, the temple, by the holiest person, the high priest, the name of God would be uttered and the people would many times prostrate themselves in worship or erupt in praise to hear the name of God. But then the the city of Jerusalem was destroyed and they were scattered into all the world. And, and because of that, the name, the correct pronunciation of the name of God over decades was lost. And so it's a matter of question now. I tend to believe because the name Yah is found in scripture is the reduced form of the name of God. It's, uh, found in several places in the Old Testament, then most likely that is like my name uh, in full is Michael, but my nickname is Mike. Well, God's name in full is Yahweh, but his reduced name is Yah. And so it makes sense to me that Yahweh would be the correct pronunciation. Now let's go to the various redemptive names of God that are revealed in the Old Testament. Now, to properly explore these would take an entire program on every single name. But I'm just going to give you a basic overview so that you can realize and appreciate the profoundness of the ongoing revelation of the name of God as found in Scripture. All right, let's go to let's go to Abraham's life and the names given to God during his lifespan. What about Genesis 22, verse 14? That's the place where Abraham had built an, offer to, uh, an altar to offer up Isaac in obedience to God. And miraculously, right at the crisis moment, when the knife was poised over Isaac, and in just a split second he would be sacrificed, God caused a ram to appear in the bush not far from Abraham, and he was caught in this thorny bush. And Abraham went and took the ram for a sacrifice. And Isaac went free. And all of that is symbolic. But Abraham named the name of that place the Lord our provider in English. But in Hebrew, of course, the traditional way of saying it is Jehovah Jireh. And yet, as I mentioned a while ago, there's no J in Hebrew originally. And so the more proper name in Hebrew would be Yahweh Ira, the Lord our provider. Many people have used that name for God to emphasize God supplying their natural needs, their material needs, their financial needs, which certainly God is not averse to doing. He wants to bless his people and meet their needs in that area. However, the original setting where that name was given to God, actually, uh, it was not given to God by Abraham, but given to the altar and the area there where the altar was built. And originally it meant God providing a substitute in death. That's the highest meaning of that name for God, 
Yahweh Ira means God provided a substitute for us in the death of the Son of God on the cross. Not a ram that was caught in the thicket, but a, a, an eternal manifestation of God that hung on a cross for our redemption. Yes, he is Yahweh Ira, the Lord our provider. He provided for sin to be forgiven. He provided for our souls to be restored. He provided for the curse to be broken and the satanic control of our lives to be demolished. Thank God he provided. Let's go to another name for God found, say in Exodus. This one is in the life of Moses. There was a battle going on with the Amalekites. And as long as Moses kept his hands lifted up, then Israel would prevail. But if he ever grew weary and dropped his hands down, then the Amalekites would prevail. So Aaron and Hur stood on either side of him and they kept his hands lifted up and Israel won that day. And an altar was built there. Moses built the altar there and he called it Yahweh Nisi. And again, the word translated Yahweh is the Tetragrammaton uh, that is often translated Lord in English Bibles. So in many of your English Bibles, it will say he named the altar the Lord Our Banner. Because see, an army would have a banner that indicated what they were fighting for or who they were fighting for, the nation they represented, the nation that they were entering into battle to, uh, to conquer an enemy in the behalf of. And so we fly the banner of the name of the Lord over our lives. The Lord, our banner, is the one who fights our battles for us. We're not just going into battle for him. He's going into battle for us. The Lord will fight for you and you will hold your peace. And all you have to do is keep your hands lifted up and keep praising God. And the enemy will be thrown back and conquered and trampled underfoot. Let's go to the book of Judges. And then we'll come back to Exodus in just a minute. I love this name given to God. Uh, and actually, once again, it was technically a name given to an altar and by relationship given to God as a redemptive name for him as well. But Gideon uh, had the wonderful privilege of conquering the Midianite army. And in order to prepare himself for the battle, he knew he had to tear down the groves and the altar where his father worshipped a false god, which he did. He tore down the altar, and then he built an altar unto the Lord, and he named that new altar that was consecrated to the true God, Yahweh Shalom. And Shalom is a very powerful Hindu, uh, a powerful uh, I'm sorry, not Hindu, a powerful Hebrew word that means numerous things. It means more than just peace. It means rest and peace and prosperity and health and wholeness. To say Yahweh Shalom is to say, may God grant all of these things to you, peace and rest and health and prosperity and wholeness, nothing missing, nothing broken. That's why Jews often, when they come into each other's presence or leave each other's presence, will say shalom. It's a prayerful, prophetic proclamation over that person's life. And Gideon strangely named the altar and by identification was naming God, Yahweh Shalom, before he went into battle with the Midianites. So he was proclaiming that God, Shalom, shalom the God of peace, the God of shalom, would grant him peace before he even fought the enemy. Maybe we should go into battle with the same kind of mindset that he is Sar Shalom. He is the prince of peace. He's the God of peace who said he would bruise Satan under our feet shortly. That's in Romans chapter 15. So before you even face a battle, declare God is my peace and he's going to fight this warfare for me. Now, let's go back to Exodus. The first revealed name that God actually gave himself. This is not a name for an altar now. This is the name God gave himself after the children of Israel exited Egypt. Remember when they came to bitter waters called Merah and the waters were not drinkable? Moses cried out to God. 
for the way to somehow remove the pollution, the contamination from the waters or the bitterness. For some reason, they were not drinkable waters. And the people lapsed into unbelief. They said, Moses, you brought us out here to kill us in the wilderness because there weren't enough graves in Egypt. It's appalling how quickly people fall back into unbelief, even after they've received miracles in their lives. And so Moses prayed and God showed him a tree that he threw into the waters and they were made sweet. They were not only made drinkable, they were made sweet from one extreme to the other. Isn't that God's way? And God entered into a covenant with them there. And in Exodus 15, 26, he said, I am the Lord who heals you. And he told them, if you'll obey my voice, keep my statutes, my judgments, then I will bring none of those diseases upon you that I brought upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. That's Yahweh Rapha. So if God names himself the Lord, your healer, he intends to heal you. You should learn Exodus 15, 26 and quote it every time you may face some kind of affliction. And really that name for God is a promise to prevent you from getting sick, not just to heal you if and when you do get sick. Because he said, I will bring none of those diseases upon you. Now, one of the most amazing Yahweh titles, and I've got two more I'm going to share, is found in Jeremiah 23, verses 5 and 6. This is a prophecy of the coming Messiah, where Jeremiah said, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will raise to David a branch of righteousness. A king shall reign and prosper and execute judgment and righteousness in the earth. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will dwell safely. Now, this is his name by which he will be called, and in the Hebrew, Yahweh Sidkenu. That's T-S-I-D-K-E-N-U. But in the English, the Lord, our righteousness. And that's the miracle of biblical righteousness, biblically revealed righteousness, is the fact that it's not self-attained. We live righteous lives as an act of worship toward God and in obedience to God, but our righteous status is primarily obtained by faith in the God who becomes our righteousness. He did say God made Jesus to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. He is Yahweh Sidkenu, the Lord, our righteousness. He's our source of being right with God. And also, one of my favorite names for God revealed for the first time in 1 Samuel is the Lord of Hosts. That's the English version. The Lord of Hosts means the God of an army of angels that are poised and ready for battle. But in the original Hebrew, it's Yahweh Saba or Yahweh, Yahweh Sabaoth, the Lord of Hosts, the God of an army of angels who are poised and ready for battle. Call on that name of God and expect an angelic force to come to your rescue. And there's so many other names for God, like El Shaddai, as I mentioned earlier, which means the Almighty God, and El Elyon, which means the Most High. You find both of those in the beginning of Psalm 91. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High, El Elyon, shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty, El Shaddai. When you make him the Most High, El Elyon in your life, his power is released into your life and he becomes El Shaddai. He becomes the Almighty God. He's also called El Gabor, which means the Mighty God. Finally, I want to end with this, the priestly proclamation of Numbers chapter 6. God gave this prayer to the priests in order to pronounce this prayer over the children of Israel. So he fully expected to answer it, or he never would have given it. He said to pray this way, and again, in the English versions of the Bible, it uses the word Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. But the word translated Lord there is Y-H-W-H, the tetragrammaton, yud Hey bab Hey. So I'm going to use the Hebrew rendering when it comes to the name of God. Yahweh bless you and keep you. Yahweh make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. 
Yahweh lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace, or in the Hebrew, give you shalom. Nothing missing and nothing broken. And then God explained concerning the priests, so shall they put my name on the children of Israel, and I will bless them. So that's what I've done on this podcast. I've put the name of the Lord on you, and the blessing of God is going to follow.